Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Dominic DePaolo. He's a field bot- botanist and vegetation ecologist who lives and works in the klamath Siskiyou region of southwest Oregon in Northern California. For the past 15 years, he's studied the ecology and history of the forests, woodlands, shrublands, and grasslands of this diverse and complex region, as well as gotten to know many of its non- as many of its non-human inhabitants as possible. He's currently published work on the historical vegetation of the Applegate Valley in Oregon and is currently developing vegetation cover maps for Crater Lake National Park and Lava Beds National Monument. So first off, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Well, thanks, Derek. So I, I, I was going to ask you to start by talking about uh, the, the threat of thinning in the forest there, but before we do that, can you spend just a couple minutes talking about the wondrous area that is the klamath Siskiyou region, and just a couple of minutes talking about the the biodiversity there currently and also perhaps historically, and prehistorically, sure. really. Yeah, um, well, it's one of the most biodiverse regions on Earth, um, and uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, where it sits latitudinally, um, you know, as well as being close to the, the ocean, but also geologically, it's extremely diverse, having a lot of serpentine soils, these really weird, weird soils that inhibit plant growth that have been pushed up from the seafloor, um, intermixed with really productive uh, ground as well as a lot of vol- volcanic um, geology. So it's a really heavy mix. Um, you know, a long history of human habitation. Um, you know, so uh, Native Americans and 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 more recently Euro Americans. Um, you know, so all this kind of together has created this complex mosaic of forest, woodlands, shrublands, serpentine, adapted vegetation, uh, all kind of jumbled into one another, uh, which makes it a really interesting and, and very difficult place to kind of uh, figure out. And um, who are some of the um, primary, I, I recognize you said it's a mosaic, but who are some of the characteristic species who um, who inhabit this region um, like I, I live on the coast you know what 50 miles from you and sure. um, here the the one of the primary species is of course redwood and salmon so who are some of the the primary characteristic species of that region well certainly salmon um, you know the rogue river drainage is one of the more productive salmon uh, runs in the in the lower 48 still clamus as well, um, on a similar scale, if not bigger. Um, you know, in a forest setting, you're going to have a lot of Douglas fir, um, some uh, several pine species, the sugar pine, which is the largest of the of the pine species in the world, uh, and ponderosa pine, and sense cedar. And if you um, kind of you can move really quickly right into from a forest into more of a woodland or a grassland or shrubland setting. You know, Shrublands are typically dominated by manzanita, a lot of wildflowers, you know, just a heavy diversity of flowering plants. Um, you know, the, and in the woodlands, more uh, Oregon white oak is really a common one, and then uh, California black oak, the larger oak tree. And these kind of all kind of intermix as well as kind of incur, occur in, in their own kind of patches as well. So, so next, can we move to a, um, before we go to current threats of logging, can we talk about, say, give a, a three or four minute thumbnail sketch of a hundred years of logging in the region? Sure. Uh, it, it and what that's done. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, initially a lot of the logging was what was easy to get to. It's a very steep and, and, you know, dissected landscape. So, um, most of the logging early on was done on valley floors, uh, you know, stuff that was easy to get to. You can drive the wagon right up or the, the railroad or, or build a road right up to it. And um, so it was, it was mostly high-grade logging where they took the largest trees. Um, it, you know, once we got our, our, our bulldozers and whatnot, <laughs> and they can, then the Forest Service was able to build a pretty extensive road network, uh, total clear-cutting was kind of more the the norm for for more like the 40s on so um there are still old growth forests around they're in patches they're kind of on steep slopes and higher up in drainages places that they weren't really quite able to get to before 
that program was shut down. Um, and early on, you know, a lot of, there was a lot of overstory removal, um, you know, with varying effects, whether, whether or not that was clear cutting or not. But I think there was a lot of leave trees and things like that were, that were left behind. Um, whereas clear cutting was more of full removal down to the soil followed by tree planting. So it's kind of a mix of these patchworks of old clear cuts and then in kind of uh, valley floor settings, you know, recovering forest as well as pretty damaged forest and, uh, you know, and these kind of tight little draws that contain these little groves of old growth that hadn't been logged. Um, before we actually jump into the, the, the topic itself, there's there's just a little bit of, of gossip, which may actually be useless to anybody who doesn't live in this area. Do you drive 199 from up up along, you know, the sort of Grants oh, yeah. Pass? So there are some clear cuts along there. I've been living here for 15 years, and before that I drove down for another five years. So there are some clear cuts along there that are, I'm thinking of two in specific, that are at least 20 years old that still don't have trees bigger than about five feet. Um, yeah, this, yeah. Some certainly recover, but there, there are some of them that it's just it's stunning how little has come back. Yeah, and I think that just really speaks to how uh, how diverse the, the the geology is around here. Um, you know, you can go from one site to another, uh, and the productivity can just change so dramatically. Um, you know, there's limestone outcrops, which are some of the most productive geologies. Uh, you know, right next to some of the least productive geologies around so uh yeah there was there was a, a lot of stand failure following cutting uh in places you know for a var- variety of reasons steepness hotness and then the, just the productive the productivity of the soil um, so yeah they, they have forest service the agencies that had a, historically had a really hard time in some areas getting the forest to recover after pretty heavy heavy cutting oh there's one it's right near the. It's it's ironic. It's right next to to a resort called Almost Paradise or something like that. <laughs> and if you look just behind the resort, they clear cut a hillside. And I've seen this for twenty years, and it's it's still that one is finally starting to come back a little bit. But it's it's always struck me that you know which resort I'm talking about, right? I, I'm not sure, but it's just across the Oregon border and um, from California, and then it's it's called Almost Paradise or something like that, and and of course it. Probably was almost paradise, maybe a hundred years ago. Um, so, so we currently have another another round of pushing for for uh, deforestation or for timber cutting or for whatever you want to call it. So, can you talk about this latest threat to the forests of the region? Sure. So, the the BLM and Forest Service are they they still sell timber. They've been um, for putting up timber sales. Uh, you know, in, in the era of the Northwest Forest Plan, which is, uh, you know, the, the compromise agreement that allowed for forestry while protecting old growth dependent species. Um, you know, the strongest protections there really apply to the designated late successional reserves. However, the rest was dubbed matrix. And in here, um, you know, the restrictions are a lot less for harvest. And the BLM and the Forest Service are putting up timber sales that involve partial cutting of stands some over soil removal, um, a minimal amount of clear, clear cutting and entry into these late successional reserves. But also there's a lot of salvage logging that's proposed following wildfires. So that's the current paradigm. And, you know, it's not as it's not great, but it's not as bad as it had been. Um, so even with these, you know, the current Wait, can, realities... Can, can we back up a second and define sure. salvage logging? Because that's another thing that, that, that really that's, I find terrible. Yeah, and that's funny that you, I'm glad that you brought that up, because I think a lot of people thought that salvage logging went away, and it hasn't at all. Uh, Every time there's a fire here, which a lot of times these fires are, you know, you could call them restorative. They've uh, not burned at high severity, or even if they have, that's not really a big deal. The forest will recover, uh, you know, better than it was in a lot of cases, and, but that's viewed as, loss of ec- economic value in the forest from the timber industry and the, and the agencies. So they plan um, salvage timber sales in those burned forests to recoup, um, you know, what they consider their timber. And um, so they're, 
sometimes mostly targeting dead trees, but a lot of times they will take dying trees or ones that are maybe recovering. Um, you know, to get that volume before uh, it turns into snags and you know owl habitat and things like that. So let's back up again because people might not understand this that this this region, the forests of the region are fire dependent and fire is a completely natural part of its life process Mm -hmm. and and let's also i realize i'm saying this but if you could if you could talk more about this since you know a lot more about it talk also about the necessity of dead trees to a living forest sure i think one of the most striking things about dead trees in our in our region or in any forest region in the world is that a large number of the bird species actually live in cavities and these are the cavities that the woodpeckers are the ones are the ones that excavate those cavities so they're providing homes for all your wrens all your some of your buntings um you know chickadees i mean i can go on and on about how many different bird families of birds whole groups of birds that require these uh these woodpeckers to excavate holes for them to actually be able to have homes um that's just a, a, an example but i mean yeah, the deadwood and the snags, the standing material, the stuff that falls on the ground and rots, it's all, you know, part of the the cycle of life in the forest. Uh, when that's removed, you know, you kind of really break that, uh, that cycle. And it's one of the, probably the, the most missing elements in our forest because of years of, of removing dead trees, you know, out of fear that they'd spread more bugs, you know, all sorts of reasons. Um, but mostly to get the timber before it's <laughs> before it rots. Um, so yeah, and then I, I like to look at uh, the fire or the the fire thing or in the forest uh, more like the forest are fire adapted um, rather than dependent, and that kind of kind of opens up the the paradigm a little bit. That you know, there's a, a lot of variety of fire and times, you know, durations of fire. And I think that that's kind of really important to understanding um, just the level of diversity in the, in, in the forest around here and st- the structure of the forest, the species that are growing there, the gaps and the, the dense stands and all that stuff kind of, um, you know, you, 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 can, you can kind of get a little bit more uh, open-ended diversity by describing it as a fire-adapted uh, landscape. So, so thank you for that. And they, so the timber companies and the forest service will have sometimes used the fact that there was a fire. It's like, okay, the wood's going to go to waste. Never mind that now it's a home for buntings. And also when it falls to the ground, it's home for salamanders. Um, so they say the wood's going to waste. So that, that's one cause of, that's one of the, rationales for salvage logging is they need to salvage the dollar value before it rots in the in the forest yeah okay yeah that's the primary okay so so i'm sorry i interrupted a while ago so keep going about about salvage logging and then you were going to go to thinning yeah so the the, you know the federal agencies are are under a, a lot of increasing pressure to to ramp up logging um, you know, most of the timber sales that they put up aren't being challenged by environmental groups. Uh, you know, they've, for the most part, gotten away from doing really egregious stuff, except in a, you know, limited scale. And you know, enviro groups do kind of challenge those sales on a unit by unit basis and try to get the bad units dropped. There's only one, you know, whole entire timber sale that I can think of in our area that's being challenged, and that's by a community group, not a one of the environmental activist groups who, um, you know, they're, they're trying to stop a pretty heavy timber cutting that's happening right around their property on BLM land. But beyond that, there's really not uh, a lot of active, uh, you know, resistance to these timber sales from the environmental community. Really, it's just the, the realities on the ground aren't such that they can produce the timber that the politicians and the timber industry really want them to. But Nonetheless, they're they're going for it. Um, so the BLM just released their resource management plan, uh, calling for a 270 about a 270 million board feet uh, annual cut. Uh, 
the Forest Service is planning on re- releasing their plan. Uh, their, re- their, they call it something different, but their forest management plan. Uh, and that also has an increased timber volume quota. Um, and both these agencies, uh, well, BLM in particular, is being threatened with a lawsuit from the, 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 the county governments in southern Oregon as well as some timber industry people to actually uh, cut 500 million board feet a year off their land. And the BLM has even said that they couldn't do this. They couldn't even produce that much. Meanwhile, uh, Peter DeFazio, our congressman in Western Oregon, has met with Forest Service and BLM staff and has told them that they better find a way to cut more timber or they're going to have to start selling off public land. And all this is really to get the counties... um, what they were receiving in, in, in revenue from the federal government prior to the end of old growth logging and the end of a direct subsidy that um, the, the, gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a rural schools and something or other act that was a direct subsidy that made up the lost revenue that they were getting in royalties from timber, you know, federal timber. Oh, let's, let's back up on that uh, for a moment again. I'm sorry, to um, for people especially who don't live in the West that, that the and and can you give like a one minute description of the in lieu logging? Um, yeah. Because people might not know why local places would have to get money from what, what the rationale is for that. Sure. It's called payment in lieu of taxes, and it was payment in lieu of property taxes. So the federal land, you know, a lot of these county governments are predominantly federal land, um, and the, pay, the, the feds don't pay any property taxes on that, which is primarily how the counties raise their revenue is through property tax. Um, and around here, at least, uh, our county uh, population, as well as the government, uh, hates property taxes <laughs> with a passion and refuses to raise them at any reasonable rate. So now we actually, I live in a county that is literally lowest, the lowest property tax rate in the, lowest, in the lower 48. But they're, um, what they were getting was royalties off of federal timber, uh, and that was kind of a lot of places in the West get uh, royalties off of extraction of natural resources from the federal government. So um, you know it it makes up for the fact that they're not able to raise a tax base on all that land that's owned by the federal government. So basically, However, it, so go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say they don't actually have to manage that land. They don't have to provide services to that land. There's no cost to the county on that land except for some foregone future revenue that they would hope to, to make from it. And it's an extraordinary, extraordinary reality that basically they are having to destroy their land base to pay for their schools. I mean, that's just, that's, that's, a, that's an incredibly, that's a nutty system. It's a broken, broken system for sure. Okay, so um, so, uh, okay. so the counties are arguing that that the logging that then the counties are screaming that the logging has to go up because they want more money. Yeah, and refuse to pass a property tax increase. Um, so, meanwhile, our congressional delegation, DePazio and Senator Ron Wyden, um, have been putting. Uh, Putting bills in Congress to increase cutting in Southwest Oregon, well, in in, in Western Oregon in general, uh, in particularly what's called these ONC lands. Uh, these are federal lands that were acquired by the federal government um, through different means. They 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 were taken back from a railroad company after they were you know, being used fraudulently, uh, and um, have different congressional mandates to their management. Um, so there's a real, uh, you know, a real pressure coming from the timber industry, the counties, and the Oregon congressional delegation, which are all Democrats, uh, to increase logging on federal land. Uh, and you know, the the, the agencies are more, you know, they're more than willing to try, um, but there's a lot of you know legal and just physical realities to getting the amount of volume and the amount of revenue that, that the politicians and the timber industry and the counties want. Um, so in comes the Nature Conservancy, and they 
and a few other groups, um, they have a plan to kind of push past this impasse, this imagined impasse between jobs and environmental protection. And in doing so, they really are trying to relieve us of a major reality check, which is the serious structural problems in the timber industry, the county governments, uh, you know, even the, the Oregon delegation and the members of the public pining for the good old days. They're just not willing to face these realities. And by good old days, you, you don't mean the good old days when we had intact forests. You mean the good old days of a lot of logging. Days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Back when, you know, and most of these guys aren't going to pick up a chainsaw even if it you know, came to it. But, um, you know, as the narrative goes, there's this call to increase federal, uh, you know, logging on federal land from the TNC, these forest collaboratives, and the agencies, um, because, you know, there's this narrative that the fires of the West have been suppressed in the forest, uh, and therefore after decades of this fire suppression, the forests are now overgrown with young trees and shrubs. They're out of whack ecologically, and they're all at risk of catastrophic wildfire everywhere, and the entire forest is going to burn up, and we need to thin across the entire landscape in order to get it back to how it should be, in order to make it safe once again for people to live in the forest. Um, so that's the, 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 you know, the quick and dirty of the narrative, but so the plan... what a again, surprise, what a surprise. I would never believe, I would never in a million years believe that the solution to problems in a forest that is suggested by members of this extractive culture is to cut down more of the forest. Yeah. Color me surprised. I know. Well, well, it's almost like any any um, solution has to have uh, jobs attached to it. It has to have this economic, um, you know, fairyland, uh, you know, being put to it because. You know, that's the most important thing. It's the most important thing to a politician to, to, to come up with the answer. You know, they need, they need to be relevant. So, uh, and I think the TNC is kind of following that same, you know, false, lo false logic that, that they, need, they need to be coming up with the, the, you know, the silver bullet answer to everybody's problem. And the thinning's really been kind of sold that way, that it's just, it's going to, you know, cure cancer. Uh, but, you know... There, there are limitations to doing this. So, so, so what I is guess, thinning? Uh, um, it can be a lot of things. I mean, just to be clear, I'm not against all thinning. You know, I think there's some reasonable amount of um, precautions you need to do if you're going to live near a forest, uh, you know, just around your home. But really, the idea is that um, you know, vegetation is you know when a when a fire comes through is fuel for that fire. And by thinning it out, and, uh, that you can affect how that fire burns. So in a forest, you're talking about, um, you, know, remo you know, removing a number of the trees, leaving behind, um, you know, a number of the trees, but you're removing a certain number of the stems uh, in order to get it to some density. And, you know, you kind of replicate that to any other vegetation. You know, in a shrub, in a shrubland, um, you're taking a lot more because the shrubs tend to be a lot more ubiquitous. But you're just kind of taking it, taking out enough of the individual plants to leave behind evenly spaced or nicely spaced individuals, uh, woody plants, um, to to whatever your, you know, whatever your liking is. And when they when they do thinning. Um, I presume that means that they're not actually, they never, ever, ever cut any big trees. They only cut little things, right? No. Yeah, I wish that was the case. That's what we were sold all this on, was that that's what they'd be doing. But um, I've been watching this happen over the last 15 years, and a lot of times, and I'll get to this, why it is, but there's a lot of mercantile timber, as they call it, being removed. So logs. These are large trees, um, mostly Douglas fir uh, a lot of times because that was considered uh, an interloping tree, something that came in with fire suppression. Um, but it's also really the most valuable timber tree, and a lot of these trees are that are being cut, you know, are upwards to 38 inches in diameter in some of these 
uh, which is a that's an old growth tree. So they are targeting younger trees. They are really doing this fuels reduction, but at the same time they're doing this, a lot of times they're taking out uh, a lot of larger trees. So there's a, a couple lines from the uh, Nature Conservancy, I should say Nature Sick Conservancy, um, SIC, um, document that you sent that I, I want to read because it, it seems to me that this is a lot of what's wrong with what's going on. Um, application of the treatment themes, and I just love their, I love their euphemisms too, um, treatment themes as opposed to clear cutting, as opposed to deforestation, etc. Application of the treatment themes to the available and accessible federal lands, it's Forest Service and BLM, would treat, treat, cut, 1.1 million acres and generate an estimated 2.1 billion board feet of restoration by- byproduct. And so I just love that. Restoration byproduct, um, which is actually what that means is timber. Um, exactly. Of that total acreage, 883,000 acres would require subsidy but generate 1.2 billion board feet of restoration byproduct. A final 206,000 acres would be economically viable and blah, blah, blah. The point is, there's a couple of points. One is, we are talking about a lot of land. That's 100,000 a acres. Lot of land. Yeah. And the second oh, thing, more than that, more than, way more than that. Well, that just for Sorry, that, go ahead. just for those two sentences. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Tell me about way more than that in a moment. The other thing is that um, even by their own admission, eighty percent of that would require subsidy. So basically, this is the American taxpayers paying in this collapsing economy, in this huge deficit spending economy. This is American taxpayers paying to destroy the forests. Yeah, even the timber program at the at the federal agencies is uh, losing is lo- loses money on the timber sale. So Absolutely, it's just it's just nuts. We'd all be better off. The American public would be better off if they would just go ahead and hand them the money and tell them to sit at home in their underpants and watch the prices right. You know, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, yeah, and it is it's very much uh, it's welfare for the timber industry in a lot of ways and. Um, you know, it doesn't really pro- provide a whole lot of jobs. Even if they could get these timber mills going back, uh, you know, it could be a wash. You know, you can get 300 timber jobs, but you know, you lost a recreation economy or something like that. So, when they when they're talking about doing the the treatments, they're talking about um, they're talking about cutting, you know, logging these forests down to a 40 percent canopy closure. Uh, you know, then that's restoration. That's what their goal is for restoration. And um, so typically a mature forest around here that hasn't burnt in a while uh, will have about 60 to 80 percent canopy. Uh, so that's a pretty significant reduction. And if you're talking about 40 percent canopy from down from an 80 percent canopy, you're, you're talking about taking a lot of mature trees. And I've seen a lot of their thinning projects and there's a lot they're not taking the biggest and the best always um but they're taking a lot they're taking what they can and let's talk for a moment about i want for in in a moment i want for you to talk about how how many acres we're talking since it's way more than a million but um can you talk about what reducing from 80 to 40 percent cover might do to microclimates and to habitat for those who live under because I know that many amphibians, for example, require um, require um, moist, cool areas, and so do many fish. And I get, but maybe we're not talking about riparian zones. I don't know. And then also, yeah. I remember reading somewhere that it takes about fifty feet for um, the edge, or maybe it's further, for the climate to get normal from the edge of a forest for like if you're in a in a field, it can be one temperature. You walk into the forest and you're five feet in, and it's already cooler. But for you to actually get beyond the edge effects, it has to be much much farther for microclimate. Yeah, I mean, I think, when, yeah, I mean, forty percent canopy closure from from something that was a lot more dense. Uh, you're gonna, I mean, the, they're trying to remove trees that are growing in you know, into the crowns or next to the crowns of other trees that they're going to leave and things like that. So you're really, what you're doing is you're, you're creating a lot of light that's going to hit the, the ground. And, 
you know, the whole idea that, that of this is that they're restoring it to this perceived historic uh, stand structure of these large, open-grown trees, inter, you know, evenly spaced or interspaced, um, with a, an understory that's really dominated by grass. So they're also removing all the shrubs when they're doing this. Um, and what that does, it really does uh, promote a, a lot of herbaceous grass growth. Um, you know, whether or not that's the good grasses or there are these invasive grasses, there's a lot of them around here that do come in after these kind of uh, entries. Um, but what you end up with is a really open forest that allows a lot more, you know, wind flow to go through the understory. Uh, it's a lot more grassy. So it, it can actually dry out the forest quite a bit. And I've seen more than one example of well-intentioned thinning where they removed a lot of the trees and then all the rest of the trees, or a good chunk of the rest of the trees, died from drought in the successive years because they were used to growing with these other trees. And, you know, they're not all these trees aren't living in isolation. They're networks of roots connecting one another through mycorrhizal hyphae, the, the, all the fungal network in the soil that's connecting to all these other plants. So really this underground biome that you know, the, the forest exists on top of you know, connects every one of these trees. So they're not um, you know, necessarily you know, competing for each other for resources and they're just you know, all just in this race to the bottom when they're dense. It's that they're living in this tight network of a bunch of different species, including the fungus, that's kind of keeping this moist environment. And when you do this heavy thinning, you really break that up and you create a different kind of environment. Some would argue a more fire-prone environment. Um, you know, the, the, the justification for the canopy uh, management uh, is that if a fire was to come through, that the fires would just move from tree to tree to tree and kill all the trees. Um, you know, that's that happens when there's big wind-driven events and a fire. But you know, if there's a lot of moisture in the in the fuels, they call them. <laughs> if there's a lot of moisture in the vegetation and the trees, and you're in these kind of wetter environments, that can actually have a dampening effect on the fire. So, you know, it's kind of a it's kind of a wash in terms of their their logic there. So how many acres are we talking about in the in the region? I you know they present a couple different numbers and I the the one number that I've heard the most 2 million acres and that's that's all just in southwest Oregon. Um you know these are proposals they're not necessarily uh uh you know legally uh, signed off plans just yet but they they the TNC the Nature Conservancy has a lot of clout within the agencies and they're really the agencies have been working, they've been working pretty hand in hand, a small group of people for a long time to develop this, you know, thin the landscape approach to our forests to, to you know, re recover from the impacts of fire suppression and to be able to manage future fires. Um, so, you know, these, the amount of acreage that's involved can can vary, but we're definitely talking about a majority of the forest. Uh, two million acres is a massive amount of area. Um, and that's kind of all getting this, you know, this kind of broad brush uh, blanket approach to the kind of treatment that they want to they wanna do. It's, you know, they kind of divide it up into these four different quadrants, you know, if it's western or eastern part of the, the region, you know, the wetter side being the west. And then uh, also south slope or north slope, you know, again, based on this moisture gradient. Uh, and that's about it for <laughs> how they will, you know, divide up the landscape in terms of how they're going to propose treatments. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of detail in being applied and a little bit of nuance, but it's not much. I mean, when you're talking about a 40% canopy closure, there's something in your logic that's telling you that you you need to do that. And, you know, when when the actual effects on the ground are so varied, I just don't, you know, I think there needs to be a little reality applied to, uh, to the conceptual model. Um, so I could get into a little bit of the 
narrative or the the, the belief uh, why this is needed. That'd be great. Uh, you like me to do that. Um, so I guess the real strong justification from a um, kind of a logic or a scientific perspective that they put forward is that there's this narrative that the entire landscape of the West prior to mod- the modern era of industrial scale fire suppression following World War II was subject to this low severity ground fires at re- regular intervals, you know, around two to 15 years. And then this cleaned up the forest, uh, any buildup of dead plant material or encroaching small trees, um, they would have been, you know, taken out and the landscape would be dominated by open forests uh, or woodlands uh, with grassy understories. And they would be, you know, periodically cleared of any dense passage of shrubs and trees um, or any dense vegetation at all. And, you know, this story might hold true for portions of the landscape, um, you know, as a direct cause and consequence of frequent fire. Uh, but in particular, it would hold true for areas where soils and climate play a major role in limiting this plant growth. Uh, and, and then again, especially in, when found in combination with frequent humid ignitions in places like valley bottoms or adjacent slopes uh, and some ridge lines. Um, however, you know, this model is being applied by this um, thin landscape narrative uh, to apply to the entire landscape. You know, so that the entire landscape used to be open forest and woodland uh, with large trees and open understories dominated by grass. And any deviation from this trajectory would mean a, you know, a trajectory towards oblivion, and the whole ecological system is referred to as out of whack. So when they're seeing the forest today as you know, a lot of dense vegetation, that's a bad thing. Um, and so the idea here is that if we just get it back to the way it used to be, fires will be manageable again, and we can just, um, you know, live happy lives and, you know, oblivious to the realities of the place we live in. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a couple of flaws in that narrative, I think, that need to be examined um, pretty carefully, you know. So I think one of the first ones is that um, I think that we kind of, we really need to interrogate the concept of the ecosystem. You know, this is just starting at the most meta level here. You know, this this model really relies heavily on the idea of, of an ecosystem. And what we've learned over the last hundred years in vegetation ecology is that the community of life, you know, rather than being a completely integrated, perfectly balanced, closed ecological system that operates from some internally located central regulatory mechanism, you know, much like a machine, uh, rather than, you know, and that, in, 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 in that concept or that model, there's only two ways for nature to be in, you know, functioning or broken. You know, rather what, we've, what we have learned in vegetation ecology is that the community of life is open-ended, it's emergent, you know, these are adaptive ecological landscapes of organisms in relationship with one another. You know, and the landscape is large enough to hold many conditions for the vegetation to be in, and this will change over time. So that's kind of the, the real, uh, you know, meta-level logical flaw uh, with this thin landscape way of thinking. But uh, just at a, you know, when you apply this to actual landscapes and you try to look for evidence um, for this historically open forest maintained by low-severity fires, you know, you start to, you know, you start to search for some you're really searching for some evidence. So, uh, you know, again, this, that that model does apply to parts of the landscape, and you can find evidence for for it in parts of the landscape throughout the West. However, it's really overall when it's applied to the entire landscape, it's not really standing up. Um, so, at like a local and a regional scale, when this way of thinking is applied to a particular landscape. Um, you know, one of the major flaws that we found for the need to thin everywhere in southern in southwest Oregon was that uh, when we started looking, the, we found that the landscape historically had not been predominantly open and park-like, but rather was very diverse in its density of the vegetation. Um, so, uh, about 15 years ago, I was working with some uh, researchers at the BLM uh, when a lot of this uh, really started to kind of uh, 
take off within the agencies. And uh, we are looking for evidence for the open park lake landscape, um, you know, to just test the, you know, test that uh, uh, untested assumption. Um, you know, so what we were looking at were historical, uh, historic accounts, old photos, and mostly land surveys from the 1850s and onward, uh, some as far back as the 1820s, and we found only really minimal evidence for that open park-like setting, and it was clear that it was not dominant on the landscape, or it only dominated a portion of the landscape, and most of this was in the larger valleys and the adjacent slopes. Um, and, you know, I guess one of the smoking guns was that, you know, uh, we did look at this, one of the best, uh, you know, most fine-scale historical information that we had available were these land surveys from the Homestead Act in 1900. And these centered around the low elevations near, in the, in, in the Applegate Valley or, and in some other, some other valleys, but near, near broader valleys where you'd expect that open park-like setting to be uh, dominant. And even in these areas, we found that the vast majority of the area was dominated by dense shrubland, uh, conifer forest that was often described as having, as being young, dense stands or having brushy understories. And only a small portion of the landscape that we were able to look out through this study was grassland or savanna. Um, and much of the same area is in a similar vegetation cover today. You know, brushy shrublands, uh, oak woodlands. You know, if anything, the oak woodlands and the shrublands are just a bit older because um, they just haven't. They have. The, there was a lot of fire historically on the landscape uh, than there was than there is today. So. You know, these shrublands and woodlands are just getting older. Um, and this is, you know, from around 1900, and this is well before the modern era of fire suppression. Um, so in addition to that, higher elevation areas that are, you know, heavily forested mountains, there's been several researchers that have found a dominant pattern of historic tree recruitment prior to the era of fire suppression that um, that was of similarly aged trees. So the, the the trees were coming in following a disturbance all you know around the same time. And this is a, as opposed to the slow scattered recruitment of variously aged trees that one would expect in an open park-like forest that developed under frequent low severity fire. So again, they were you know they looked for the evidence and they found some countervailing evidence that really points to the fact that, um, you know, these trees were coming in and patch, patch recruitment is what it's kind of referred to in the forest ecology circles. So, and similar researchers from a number of different universities have found a similar pattern of patch recruitment in the mountainous regions in the west prior to fire suppression and a similar pattern of patch recruitment as being documented today in recently burned landscapes, um, you know, most notably in the Biscuit Fire area in between where the two of us live. Um, so what all this is pointing out to or pointing to is that a mixed severity fire uh, regime it was the dominant pattern and is the dominant pattern of disturbance impacting much of the high and middle and even a lot of the low elevation forests in the West, both historically and at present. You know, nothing is out of whack here except for the starting assumptions of the people involved with this in the landscape agenda. You know, you really can't apply this, you know, nifty conceptual model that may be, you know, useful in understanding a small area or a region of the country. You can't apply that anywhere you want to, uh, you know, if, whenever you find the slightest bit of evidence for it. You know, even applying the Southwest Ponderosa Pine model, which a lot of this is kind of predicated on, you know, if you apply that uniformly across the region it was even developed in, you, you're going to come up with some limitations there. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, sorry to... No, 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 it's great. This, <laughs> this is great. train of thought here. So, you know, I guess fire-prone areas of the West are often described as ecosystems, you know, vegetation types that, that evolves to require a particular fire regime, um, you know, this is kind of a way for that I've kind of come up with. Uh, a couple other folks have kind of come up with a similar way, kind of better frame the idea of, of fire regimes 
and you know fire dependent ecosystems so you know i think often fire prone areas in the west are described as ecosystems or vegetation types that have evolved to require a particular fire regime to function and remain he healthy and it's that you know that ecosystem idea this is that this is the organismal view of of the ecosystem uh, and, you know, this would apply to, you know, applying this would, you know, that imply that any deviation in structure or fire frequency amounts to degradation. So, you know, that doesn't really account or even allow for any variability or change in the landscape, you know, if you conceive of, of you know, ecosystems operating that way. So perhaps a better way to look at it is that vegetation at a particular location on the landscape has adapted to a particular pattern and frequency of fire that has prevailed at that particular point on the landscape. You know, I think that that, that kind of sufficiently opens things up to explain the variability that we see across the landscape and also allows for, for change over time. Well, I think that's really great. And we have about, about four or five minutes left, and... Um, a couple things. One one thing is that even if there was a problem to be solved, it would seem to me that having those who have a vested interest in um, extraction trying to solve the problem would be problematical in the first place. I'm thinking of the medical model. I'm thinking, would you want to go to a doctor who made money by harvesting your organs? I mean that might we would we, I think we would both agree that that might actually affect their diagnosis. Yeah. Well, I think that they are. You know, doctors already have that kind of conflict of interest. <laughs> when they, surgeons, in particular. Um, yeah, I think it's. I think it's a good point. You know, it, one of the things that I think. Um, you know, it gives it, when when the experts tell tell us that you know they sit in the forest. And therefore, now it's safe. You know, I think that one of the main problems is that it, it gives people the false impression that we can manage, we can manage the forest to make it a, a safe place to live in the way that we do now. Um, you know, there's no need for society to change or that you know uh, individuals change their behavior. We just need to change the entire environment that we live in to suit humans. You know, and this is kind of a classic behavior of, of, of colonialism. You know, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, you know, mostly that you're telling people that it's safe to live in a place that's inherently unsafe to live in. So you're going to, you know, facilitate more and more home building in these unsafe areas, which puts higher and higher costs onto the public, puts a lot of fire people, you know, firefighters in, in, in danger. And it doesn't really address the real root of the problem. You know, so... Uh, you know, I think one of the more dangerous aspects of the agenda is, you know, the thinning of the landscape to make it safe for, you know, our current society to just continue to expand into the West. It allows us to forego addressing the fundamental cause of the problem. You know, we don't really have a fire problem or a fuels problem or a forest out of whack problem. We have a problem with how we humans are choosing to live on the landscape. You know, thinning the landscape and telling people it's safe to go on with business as usual, even if that were to work, still doesn't deal with, you know, our derelict relationship with the rest of the living world, uh, which, you know, I think really centers around two things. Our system of private property, which is, you know, uh, it's called land enclosures, is, you know, how the kings took all the land away from the peasants way back in the day. We live under that system right now, and protecting that system of private property, you know, it's... Uh, it's the uh, unconscious program of, of a lot of these folks that they don't realize and they don't want to really address some of the failures in that system and how it really sets us up for a lot of these conflicts. So really, I think, you know, um, if I could, I think one of the, there's a, a fellow named William Baker. Uh, he's a fire ecologist out of uh, the University of Wyoming, and he said it way better than I could ever, uh, you know, one of the, you know, really kind of sums up the problem and solution here. Uh, do, do I have enough time to kind of recite a couple paragraphs? Yeah, great, please. So this is a William Baker, um, fire ecologist from the University of Wyoming. So he says, a prevailing story 
which no longer fits the evidence, is that fire was historically benign and manageable in fire-adapted, stable, resilient vegetation prior to Euro-American settlement, but was disrupted by a period of misguided fire control logging, grazing, and other land uses. An associated redemption story suggests that fire can be reinstated and managed using science-based prescribed burning and mechanical treatments so it can again play its role in the ecosystem without threatening homes, infrastructure, valued natural resources. The story provides a compelling, peaceful vision of harmony and stability as people would then be able to live near wildlands without fear. Wildlife and plants would also be sustained once vegetation was restored, functioning properly, and well managed by government. However, science has shown that this story does not fit the evidence, except for in limited areas. Um, fire regimes in the, in the Rockies, and he's mostly dealing with the Rockies here, here but uh, fire regimes in the Rockies were more generally dominated by historic, historically infrequent episodes of large, often severe, difficult to control fires that burned under severe weather conditions during droughts. The evidence suggests that a different relationship would be more sensible, a relationship based on humility in the face of the power of nature, a desire to minimize our impacts on the natural world and to keep as much wilderness as possible, and the good sense to get our homes and infrastructure protected or out of fire-prone settings as fire will eventually come our way. Fire is a force that shapes nature through overwhelming power, a force we cannot tame and with which we ultimately have to learn to live with if we are finally to settle into the country. So that's not me. That's <laughs> that's a fellow named William Baker who's who's really kind of punched a lot of holes in this in the landscape idea over the years with some really good research. Uh, but I think that really kind of sums up this you know claims of virtue like that you were you were saying and how that's somewhat flawed and misleading and kind of gets us into a lot more trouble than could ever they could ever solve. Well, thank you so much for all that. And is there anything else you want to say, or do you want to end on that? Um, you know, like again, I, I I would say that you know I'm not really against thinning or fuels reduction in a in, a, in an absolute sense. Um, you know, I live in the uh, Illinois Valley on 20 acres of really productive forest land in a rural residential neighborhood. And I run the chainsaw all the time. Um, but you know, what I am against is applying this prescription of management across the entire landscape using incomplete and unverified scientific knowledge and poorly tested logic. Um, you know, but what is What's been most upsetting to me, I think, is that the TNC and its agency allies have been targeting protected natural areas, unlogged areas, um, you know, other federally protected lands for these prescriptions first. You know, they're target they're they're going to these places first. Uh, you know, even even conservation easement lands. I worked at a land trust for a while, and even even our conservation lands were subject to intense pressure to thin by this group, because they were thinking that that was the best thing to do to 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 save them from themselves, I guess. Um, so, well, I'm more cynical. I actually think it's just an excuse for logging. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but it's they 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 have to look at themselves in the mirror every morning and tell themselves they're doing good work. So you know, they're, yet they're targeting these lands first, and then they're complaining about and trying to get around environmental laws and regulations. But if they just targeted the matrix lands, the tree plantations, the clear cuts, the road networks, the private timber lands. You know, the places that actually need active ecological res restoration, you know, as well as the lands adjacent to homes and in neighbor rural residential neighborhoods, they would have been total they'd be totally out of conflict with any existing environmental laws. So, you know, you know, NEPA, you know, the planning the NEPA planning that that all federal projects have to go under, they're just documenting your impacts. They're not actually telling you that they need you have to prevent those impacts. However, you know, the thin the landscape narrative that these folks are pushing, it, it helps the BLM and the Forest Service to not even do that much. You know, under that model, thinning is beneficial no matter where it's applied, and it has no impact. So, uh, you know, good luck documenting the actual impacts that are happening with these thinning projects. But luckily, there's a handful of good federal employees still doing their job and holding these guys' feet to the fire a little bit when it comes to NEPA planning. But, you know, a lot of stuff could get has gone through that I've seen that's really been destructive and really kind of been given the stamp of, of virtue, you know, through this idea of thin the landscape. Well, thank you so much for all that. Now, I'd like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Dominic DePaolo. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>